Hey, greetings. Welcome to the Brain Gauge channel. This Brain Gauge uh, metric is called the feed forward inhibition metric or feed forward inhibition. And it is computed from a couple of different measures. So feed forward inhibition is computed from uh, two measures called static threshold and dynamic threshold. Now, static threshold is the minimum stimulus you can feel. So that would be this number here, that's 13 microns on this, this chart. And the smaller the number you can feel, the better your sensitivity. Uh, plas plasticity here is marked because uh, the feed for an inhibition is actually computed between a difference between static and dynamic threshold. And that contributes to the plasticity score. So if you uh, have good feed for inhibition, it will actually improve the plasticity score. So there's a lot of different components of plasticity. I'm not gonna get into all those things here, but that's just something that you need to know. And the other thing is that, that you need to be aware of is the dynamic threshold percent correct. Those are the measures that are important if you're looking at feed forward inhibition. So what exactly is static threshold? Well, static threshold comes from basically performing amplitude discrimination task with one of the values being zero. In other words, you deliver a stimulus to a stimulus that looks like this, that has, you know, and it's usually about 20 microns versus no stimulus. And you ask somebody which one is larger. So yeah, I know some people don't like, like us to say things like that because there's no stimulus on one finger but it actually works, works very well. It's very objective for somebody to say, okay, I think I feel a stimulus on this finger uh, rather than on that finger. But you know, as you track down smaller and smaller and smaller, this value of 20 will go down to, to another value, some number between five and 10 or whatever. So obviously it's between five and 10 if you're less than 25. As you get older, those values, uh, those values go up. Your static threshold goes up because skin sensitivity goes down. So what happens with dynamic threshold? Well, dynamic threshold, we have, again, a zero stimulus presented on one finger, and we have a, a stimulus that's ramping up on the other finger. And when that stimulus ramps up on the other finger, at some point, you'll feel it. And if you can't feel it, I mean, you can't feel it at the beginning, but at some point you'll be able to feel that stimulus. When you can feel it, that's when you respond. So basically uh, it, it ramps up, it sneaks up on the threshold. And this is sort of the difference between those two thresholds. And right here you see with dynamic threshold is always larger in healthy populations, dynamic threshold is always larger than static threshold. And of course, what we're interested in is the difference between static and dynamic. As far as I'm concerned, static threshold isn't all that useful unless you're actually looking at something in the brain, which means you need to collect static and dynamic. Uh, if, unless, if you just want to measure something like uh, peripheral neuropathy and see if it's getting better, yes, static threshold is fine, but it only measures peripheral components. So basically the static threshold might be here but dynamic threshold, people generally don't detect it until it's larger. It gets past that minimum stimulus you can feel. And that's because uh, your brain circuitry is turning things off. Uh, what's going on back here when the stimulus is sub-threshold, this is all thresh sub-threshold conditioning. It's actually turning things off. It's turning on inhibition in the brain. And that's actually called feed forward inhibition. Now, I put this back up here because if you do this test, it's very important that this dynamic threshold percent correct is above 80%. In other words, it requires a response. And what happens, what can happen is when you're going up, when, when this is ramping up, if somebody just hits a button uh, and the reason, reason they have a choice over here is to make sure they're actually getting it correct. If they, if they select, say, this, this digit here and say, oh, this, I feel the stimulus here back when before they can actually feel it because they're just guessing, uh, 
then they're going to get it wrong, obviously. And, uh, you know, and if they get it wrong, then you're going to have an incorrect answer. You, they need to wait until that stimulus is large enough for them to feel it. So, I mean, that's really important that that number is large. If that number is not large and they're not waiting long enough. They're actually just trying to get through the test as fast as possible. Believe it or not, that does happen with, especially with some adolescents. Okay, so what can you learn from the feed forward inhibition metric? Well, this is some of the stuff we learned early on and it still eh, actually hasn't changed. That was 10 years ago. Over 10 years ago, we found that, well, there's a difference between acute and chronic pain. With chronic pain, this value gets, uh, the difference between static and dynamic threshold uh, goes down. And over here, this was chronic pain as well. And the static and dynamic threshold difference is smaller than it is in, in healthy controls when you compare migraine versus uh, healthy controls. Uh, something else that we found was that in autism, uh, we found these dynamic thresholds clustered into two distinct populations. And if you look over here, you'll see, well, look at the red bar first. That was one group. And we, you know, we did a large group in autism, but we found that about half of them clustered in one uh, dimension where static and dynamic did not differ. And then we found another group that had a huge difference between static and dynamic threshold. And it turned out that, you know, as you know, autism is a developmental disorder, but this was, this cutoff was around age, the age of 22. So that was just kind of an interesting finding and people say, oh yeah, you'll never see that again. But that has been repeated many, many, many times in many studies in autism, uh, especially. Uh, it's been repeated a few times in pain studies. But the, the, in adolescence, you see that there's just no difference between static and dynamic uh, threshold, whereas in uh, typically developing uh, controls, uh, there's a huge difference between that. And that's, like I said, that's been repeated a few times. So what exactly is going on? Well, subthreshold stimuli, that means stimuli you can't feel. The first thing that they do is they turn on inhibition. That inhibition is mediated primarily by uh, GABA-B and these neurogliaform cells. And these neurogliaform cells are, you know, let's say they're in layer four, this is where thalamic input's coming in. So th this whole thing, uh, they turn that on and uh, they turn on the inhibition. And when it turns on inhibition, that means the next stimulus is more likely or less likely to actually turn on this thing. So it rate, turning on inhibition lowers or raises the threshold. It turns down sensitivity. Threshold keeps getting higher and higher and higher. So neuroglioform cells, by the way, play a, the, the neuroglioform cells that we predicted to actually play a really large role in this uh, actually are the only cells in the brain that make insulin. So they make, and a lot of people don't realize that insulin is built, made in the brain. That's not the only place. Obviously the pancreas makes a lot, but for a long time, people didn't realize that. Uh, and, uh, so, so when you start, you start wondering, well, we have cells in the brain that make insulin and, and play a huge role in this inhibitory process, then what would we learn by looking at a population with the same measure that, uh, if we looked at a population that had an insulin problem. So if you have deficient insulin in the brain, that means these neurogliaform cells are probably going to become hyperactive because they want to produce more insulin. Okay. That's a hypothesis. Well, when we tested a, a rather large cohort of uh, people that were pre-diabetic, we found that their, uh, their, their feed forward inhibition was double what it normally, what normally is. In other words, they are hyperactive. Whereas these other populations, that had some type of neurological insult, 
or neurodevelopmental disorder like autism or an insult like chronic pain, uh, where they had less lower than normal feed forward inhibition. The, uh, the insulin mediated or insulin impacted uh, uh, cohort of diabetics, they had a huge, huge level of feed forward inhibition. And there's all kinds of implications mm -hmm. uh, about diabetes and you know what actually, uh, what, what is the role that, that the brain plays in diabetes and what is the impact that diabetes has on the brain? So, you know, there's obviously some interactions going on uh, with diabetics and the brain, with diabetes in the brain, and uh, we'll talk about that more later. Anyway, if you have questions about this, uh, sure, talk about it some more. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching.